So um, thank you for coming. Thank you for organizing this, this forum um, and for exploring this concept of sharing ideas uh, across three cities and in different disciplines. And I guess my understanding, this is a part of the celebration of mathematics for planet Earth, which was um, the year 2013. And we find ourselves um, a week away from the traditional end of the year before the calendar shift of the Middle Ages, um, but the year used to end um, around the solstice, which was the 25th. And so as the last talk of the evening, I will try to um, mix in a little bit of culture with climate science. And I'll start with this picture. Does anyone have an idea of what this is? Any ideas? It's, um, it's a famous seascape painting from a, 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 a turns out to be a very well-known seascape painter. I didn't, I didn't know it at the time. His name is Ivan Ivazovsky, and um, it was a 19th century ski, seascape painter. But what's the scene? Anyone want to guess what the scene is? Hmm? Ice? No ice. It's the ocean and it's a cloud. You should know this. Um, would you? It's weather, Gavita. It's it's a deeper theme. It's actually, if you believe the creation stories of the sort of Abrahamic tribes, so Christians and and Muslims and 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 Jews, they had the idea that the earth was created by a creator, and on the second day, the creator created the atmosphere. And the way it was a he, the way the way he did it, as the story goes, is does anyone know how the story goes of creating the atmosphere on the second day? It's, it's kind of interesting. I didn't know this. I'm not, I'm not religious. I just happened on this when I was giving a lecture. And it turns out that to create the atmosphere, I always had in my mind that you had to, you know, first you separate light from darkness, um, and then the second step you do is you kind of separate air from water or something to create the atmosphere. It turns out that they had the idea that to create the atmosphere, you have to separate water from water. And that's what this painting is. It's, it's on the second day of creation. It's the separation of water from water to create the atmosphere, which I find is a, a profound idea. Because if you go back to this creation stories, they had the idea that the, the, the defining concept of the atmosphere was the water that it holds. So the, you can't really think about the atmosphere without thinking about the water that it holds. So, so from the very primitive stories, the atmosphere is that thing that holds the water. It's this hydrosphere above and the hydrosphere below. I was... Um, I, I, in my fall vacation at Hamburg to um, Herbstferien, we went to Sicily with my family, and there they have these old um, cathedrals and the mosaics. So this is a mosaic from um, Montreal above Palermo. And it's the same scene again, right? So this is a scene, and it's pointing, it's showing the idea of the creator here in royal blue, separating water below into the water above. So the first one is over there. I didn't take the picture of that because that's not important. That was the radiation people, light from darkness. But this is the atmosphere people. Here's the creation of the atmosphere by separating water from water into this hydrosphere above and the hydrosphere below. So again, you have this very early idea that to really even begin thinking about the atmosphere, you have to think about the water that's in it. And this is, this is actually a provocative idea because if you look at traditional ways of studying the atmosphere, you think of the atmosphere as sort of this dry vessel, a dry gas. And then when you get more sophisticated in your third semester, you kind of add water to it. And what, what, what even primitive Christians seem to know is that you really can't think about the atmosphere in any reasonable way without thinking about it in terms of the water that it holds. So now is another question for you. If, um, if we say the atmosphere, if we, if we say that this reservoir here is um, 2,500 meters, that's the oceans and, and the lakes. So if you spread them over the whole Earth, because the oceans only co cover about 70% of the Earth, but if you spread it over the whole Earth, you get a depth of about 2,500 meters. And this, you know, the creator he did it all in one day. How much work did, did he actually do? How much water did he put in the atmosphere? Here it's the condensed stuff, but let's just take all of the water. And if you take all of the water that's in the atmosphere and you were to condense it and spread it on the ground, how, um, how deep would that be? Does anyone have a guess? So this defining thing, this is what makes the atmosphere the atmosphere, really. Um, it's the water that's in it. So how much is there? It's, 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 it's less even. It's two and a half centimeters. So in, in the old English unit, that's the only time I've seen an inch be useful because it's about the depth of the water that you have in the atmosphere. It would be an inch of water which would cover the whole surface or two and a half, 2.54. 
centimeters, about two and a half centimeters. But when they, when they, when they did this, they didn't have the idea, I think, these, these early people of, of creating it. I don't think they had the idea that, that, that there was water vapor, at least also in this mosaic they didn't have it, because the hydrosphere above where the rain fell out of, you know, they probably didn't have an idea of water cycle, of water evaporating and condensing, who knows. But there was water above that would fall down from the, from the vault in the heavens. And so they were really thinking of the condensed water when they thought of water in the atmosphere. And a lot of people, when they think of water in the atmosphere, they think of clouds, which are the condensed phases of water. And that gives the atmosphere so many of its important properties. And so that's the next question. How much, um, how much, how much water is actually condensed? in the atmosphere, this thing that gives the atmosphere all of its properties. So if you take all of the liquid water and all of the solid water that's in the sky and you brought it to the surface and put it in a liquid form and spread it around over the surface, how much would it be? It would be, I, I always wanted to do this, it's about this much. <laughs> that's it. And when you spread that over a square meter, per square meter, if you spread that over a square meter, it's going to be gone by the end of the lecture. And it's more or less spread over a square meter. It gives you a thickness of 0.1 millimeter. So even though the all-powerful is all-powerful, he really didn't do a day's work in lifting a millimeter of water up into the hydrosphere um, for the second day. But in doing that, the atmosphere took on properties that made it um, behave like it is. And it turns out, and what I will try to tell you in this lecture, which is um, titled roughly the powerful consequences of simple ideas, water in the atmosphere. And it's based on a, on a sorry, let me go back here. It's based on um, an article I wrote here in um, Physics Today. The basic idea that I would like to convey in this lecture, and I will skip some things at the end just to stay on time, because it's normally more like a 50-minute lecture or 55-minute lecture. Um, the basic idea is that everything we know about the atmosphere and that we're confident about really comes from properties of water. And almost everything we don't know about the atmosphere has to do with the properties of water. So a lot of climate scientists like to show you, and they put them in the reports, this very complicated picture of the Earth system with trace gases doing this and reacting with that and plowing, plowed fields with tractors leading to you know, more dust being transported in the atmosphere and rivers washing away this and all of this stuff. And what they don't really tell you is that none of that stuff actually really matters very much. The things that really matter and that we, th that we really understand have to do with water, and the things that really matter that we really don't understand have to do with water. So if we did this asymptotically, all of those other things are epsilon to the n, where n is a large number um, compared to water. And so I will try to convince you of that um, through the, the rest of the lecture. So there's two faces of water that you have to think about when you think about water in the atmosphere. And one face of water we know, and that's the, this idea of the two hydrospheres, the hydrosphere above, which are these clouds. So this is a view of the Earth. It's a funny thing when you look at the Earth. Sorry, it's a bit of a distraction. But it's somehow I think there's something deeply human when you look at the Earth. It kind of makes you feel, it's like looking at pizza. It's one of those things that makes you feel good. Um, when you see the Earth in a picture, it's sort of a calming feeling looking at the Earth, our, our blue planet. So hopefully you feel calmed right now and you're not thinking of pizza. But you here when you see the Earth, you see something very familiar, our home, and you see the hydrosphere below, which is very dark, liquid water. And it's dark because it's absorbing a lot of sunlight. But that same water, when you spread it up in the atmosphere, and that tiny minuscule amount that's going away on the stage here, is all of what's responsible for the white, which is the reflected visible light. So it turns out that the water in the atmosphere is, is, is interacting with visible radiation in very profound ways, and the water in the ocean is also interacting with visible radiation in prof profound ways. Here we're scattering light, and there we're absorbing light. And it turns out for one aspect of the Earth's energy budget, which is the way it interacts with very short wavelength radiation that we get from the sun, the properties of water um, are, 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 are essential. And that's the way we normally think of water in the atmosphere. We think about the condensed phases. We think about it coming from the ocean. What we often don't think about is how water looks like from a different point of view. And so this is a picture of the Earth from space, from Meteosat. And what it's visualizing here in, in colors is, um, is essentially humidity. And it's doing that by measuring the wavelength at a relatively long wavelength, at about 6.3 microns, or about 10 times the length of the wavelength of visible radiation. So when you look in the infrared, or the thermal infrared at, at, at Earth, imagine you come from a different planet and you have big eyes because you only had infrared radiation to evolve your eyes. And so this is how the Earth would look like 
it would look like a swirling gas planet, a water vapor planet. Um, and here you see actually a lot of the fluid dynamics which drive circulations. You see these swirling motions up here and the big troughs of this ends up being very drier in the subtropics. But this swirling gaseous planet that you see when you look at the planet in the infrared underlies a lot of the fluid mechanics and fluid dynamics that, that people use to describe the Earth. And it's really about moving water around. Here you see actually clouds. And so the way the visualization works is that where the planet has very little water, you can see deep into the atmosphere to very warm temperatures because the temperatures through the atmosphere are stratified. So if you go deep to the surface, the temperatures are warm. And if you go high in the atmosphere, the temperatures are cold, which is what you know when you fly your airplane and you look at the fact that you're at minus 55 degrees Celsius when you're flying at your cruising altitude on your way back from Los Angeles like Cooper was two days ago. Um, so here you're seeing very deep in the atmosphere. Why? Because this is the dry, dry subtropics. So this would be the Car Caribbean here. And you don't see very much water vapor, which gives the atmosphere this opacity. You see deep into the atmosphere. And here, this is South America, and this is Africa, and this is the Atlantic rain band or intertropical convergence zone. Here you're seeing lots of water vapor collect collecting, and the very bright white spots are very deep cumulus clouds whose tops are very cold. So cold temperatures are shown here in white. And this is another face of water. And it turns out that most of all what we understand is due to this view of water, the way water interacts with long wave radiation. And most of what we don't understand about the climate system is to do with this face of water, how water interacts with shortwave radiation. But when we come and we say, what do we know about water that makes it help us explain so much about the behavior of the climate system? It's, it's kind of nice just to go to the molecule itself. And I like to think of water as a very happy molecule, and I'll get to that in a second. But if you remember one thing from this talk, you can remember a very little of water does a lot. And it's because water is a happy molecule. And I'll try to explain what I mean when I say water is a happy molecule. But this is a picture of the water molecule with the two hydrogens and the oxygen. And one of the interesting things about the water molecule is it's very rare as a small molecule in its asymmetry. So if you think of other small molecules in the atmosphere, you have the things like nitrogen, which are two nitrogens stuck together and by definition symmetric. If you think of other molecules which have three things in them, like CO2, that's even symmetric, right? You have um, a C and um, two O's stretched out along a line. So there's a lot more symmetry in that. Um, if you look at O2, of course, it's also symmetric. So most of the other molecules in the atmosphere, or helium, are all very symmetric. Water has this unusual asymmetry. And it also has this property that's centered around oxygen um, atom. And oxygen really loves its electrons for reasons I don't understand, but maybe someone here does. But because it loves its electrons, you get a lot of charge separation in this asymmetric molecule. So it has a, it has a, a rather large dipole moment. So that means if you turn the molecule around, you can, by, by, by changing its rotation, you can absorb or emit radiation quite effectively. And what that, what, what, what that means is the water molecule, because of its asymmetry and its charge separation, is it interacts with, with infrared radiation with an efficiency that's really magical compared to other molecules. It's just, it loves, you could say, infrared radiation. So when you ask how molecules absorb and emit radiation, what you can think of is they do it by, if they absorb radiation, that energy has to go somewhere in the molecule. So it can make the molecule rotate more, it can make the molecule vibrate more, or it can lead to a disassociation of the molecule or a change in the uh, electronic state. But at the infrared wavelength, so this is wavelength here along this axis, and this is the amount of the absorption that happens in discrete wavelengths due to discrete transitions of the molecule. So you look at quantum transitions in the molecule associated with changes in rotation of the water molecule. So here, if we look at it, this is 2.7 microns. Short wavelengths on this side are due to solar radiation. So the sun's hot, and it emits like a black body um, solar radiation, which has small wavelengths. And thermal radiation, which comes from a somewhat colder body, like the Earth, which is um, 20 times colder, happen at 20 times longer wavelengths. And so here you see the thermal emission here centered around 10 microns, whereas this is a half a micron. And this is the absorption lines of the water molecule. And most molecules, when you look at their absorption features, they have a few lines kind of scattered in bunches associated with transitions and vibrational states. What water has is this enormous rotational band, because it's this happy molecule with this, with this asymmetry, which gives it nice, angular, nice, nice quanta and angular momentum. 
and then also with the charge separation, which allows it to absorb lots of radiation here in the thermal infrared. And what happens is when you mix these rotational lines, at each one of these it absorbs radiation. If you mix these with vibrational motions, there's three vibrational modes here, here, and here, you, you get another broad swath of absorption lines. So the point about this figure is you see lots and lots of lines, especially here through the thermal infrared, which says that water's really good at interacting with infrared radiation. It turns out it's so good, there's thousands and thousands of lines that even between these lines, because of molecular collisions and Doppler effects, these lines, which are quantum transitions in the molecules, get broadened. And what you end up is you have a background absorption spectra that happens all the way through here. And this background absorption spectra is, is one of the reasons why we think of um, the greenhouse effect of water vapor, for instance, not, not saturating. So one thing you have to remember here is water is a very happy molecule. It absorbs radiation like crazy throughout the thermal infrared. Here there's very little absorption in here. But over most of the infrared, it's absorbing radiation and emitting radiation um, as happily as could be. And that's why we can make pictures from space like this, because water is so active in the thermal infrared. Um, so when you look at um, Earth's atmosphere and you know that water plays an important role in the infrared, it helps you understand some simple things, something that everyone talks about, but most people explain in a rather convoluted way, and I'll try to explain to you in a little bit better way, things like the greenhouse effect. So now we're going to say, how does a greenhouse effect work? And most people kind of start by looking at this blue and white image that I had before and picturing themselves at the surface of the Earth. But I want to explain the greenhouse effect to you, and if you understand it this way, it helps you understand climate change a little better. Is I want to explain it to you by imagining yourself at outer space and you're looking at the Earth. So you're looking at the Earth and you have your, you're seeing where the energy comes from. It comes in the infrared, around 6 to 10 microns. You have your infrared glasses on, so you can see that radiation coming to you. And what you see is that the Earth is sort of emitting at a temperature which is sufficiently warm to balance the energy it's getting from solar radiation. So the, the solar radiation is warming, it's getting it from the sun, it's warming the Earth, and it keeps warming until the Earth is warm enough so that the radiation the Earth emits is equal to the radiation it gets. Then it comes to a state of stationarity um, or, or equilibrium, you can think of it that way. Um, so when you look in the infrared and you look here, you'd say on average, the temperatures you see are very different because there's some very moist spots here and some very dry spots here, but when you look on average, what you see is the Earth is emitting at a temperature of around 255 Kelvin. That's the effective black body temperature of the Earth. You don't see the surface. You don't see all the complicated things there. And what you're doing is you're only seeing so far into the Earth. So this is the vertical height. You're looking from above down to the surface. And imagine this axis here is temperature. So the red curve is a temperature curve as you go up. So here it's warm at the surface. The temperature decreases to the top of the troposphere at about 15 kilometers. And when you're looking down at this picture, you don't see all the way down because the atmosphere is opaque in the infrared. You only see to an effective height here where the temperature is about 255 Kelvin. So what happens if you put more of a greenhouse gas into the atmosphere or if you put more water vapor? Would you see further into the atmosphere or less further into the atmosphere? So now we make the atmosphere more opaque. We add water vapor, say, a greenhouse gas. We'd make the atmosphere, because water vapor is a greenhouse gas, it's opaque to infrared radiation. So looking down to the surface, we wouldn't see as far. We wouldn't see to here. We might only see, on average, to this depth here. And what's different about that this point here than this point here, other than it's further away from the surface? It's colder. So if it's colder, that means that the effective radiation that's being emitted, because the atmosphere is more opaque, is less. And so if the temperatures, if it's emitting less radiation because the effective radiation emission height is higher and the atmosphere is colder there, that means it's not emitting enough energy to, cool, to, to get rid of the energy it's getting from the sun. So what happens? You could say the emission height goes up and the planet has to warm. So here this was the old profile and now we move the emission height from here up to here, but here it was too cold. So we're not emitting enough energy so the planet warms and then we get, um, we, we get emission at the old temperature but at different height when the atmosphere is more opaque. So that's, the, that's really the best way, time and time again, to think about the greenhouse effect, is imagine you're looking at the planet from outer space, and you're looking at the infrared opacity of the planet, and you say, at what height does it emit radiation? One thing you learn from this point of view right away that you wouldn't get if you looked at the surface is that this temperature lapse rate here, this is the change in temperature with height, we call it the lapse rate, is important for understanding the greenhouse effect. 
if you went through my example and I asked you, what if the atmosphere was not stratified with height? What if the temperature was constant with height in the atmosphere? Would adding a greenhouse gas make the surface warmer or colder? Any guesses? It would do nothing. And you wouldn't, the normal way you're taught about the greenhouse effect, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get that answer right, probably, if you thought about it from the surface and you say, well, now there's more greenhouse gases trapping heat, because they'd still be trapping heat. But the stratification of the atmosphere is very important for understanding the atmosphere. And then you ask yourself, okay, well, water is really important as the main greenhouse gas. It controls the energy budget of the atmosphere. But what about this? The stratification I took for granted, the fact that the atmosphere is, is stratified with height. This also comes from the radiative properties of water vapor. But let me go back and say a few more things about the other side of the atmosphere, which is the, 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 the scattering part of the atmosphere, which is um, in the visible, and how, how, how condensed water, so that was mostly water vapor, how does condensed water interact with radiation? So this is a graph which says size, and over here is the water molecule, it's very small. Um, and the size is in micrometers, so 10 to the minus 6 meters. So this is 10 to the minus 9, and here's, we're over here at angstroms. And typical hydrometeors here, these are particles which will be in the sky. We call them hydrometeors. And you have different classes. You have things like cloud droplets um, and simple ice crystals. And as you get to larger sizes, you find drizzle or raindrops, growls, snowflakes, and hail. And, and what you find is that they interact with radiation quite differently, um, depending on their size. But all of them are actually very good at scattering solar radiation. It turns out that these things really don't like to absorb. When you, when you have um, condensed water, it doesn't like to absorb solar radiation. If you look at the index of refraction, the complex index of refraction, which measures how much absorption there is by condensed water, it's, it's, it's one of the, uh, nature's great wonders because it changes by 10 orders of magnitude roughly for a factor of two or three in the wavelength of the radiation. And the very minimum, 10 to the minus 9 in the index of refraction, is centered exactly on the maximum of solar radiation right here at about half a micron. So there's something special about water. It really hates solar radiation, both from water, water vapor, but even more so for condensed water. So condensed water mostly likes to scatter radiation. But the scattering goes as the surface area of the condensed phases. And so the things that scatter radiation best are the small things because they're very good at spreading a given amount of water that wants to scatter over lots of surface area. So by making the water droplets small, you scatter radiation very good. And when you make them big, you don't normally see, when you look in the sky, unless the sun's in a certain way, you normally don't see the rain, even though there might be more water in the rain than there is in the cloud um, that's, that's left behind. Something else that's very interesting about water is that the speed at which a small spherical particle falls through the atmosphere. If it's very small, it falls according to a fluid dynamic regime. Again, if we look at these asymptotic limits that, that Rupert mentioned, it falls according to a regime that's, that's, we call it Stokes flow. So it's in the Stokes regime. And it turns out that they fall at a speed that depends on the square of the radius. So if you look at a cloud droplet here, which is about 10 microns, it falls at about a few centimeters a second. And it, it goes as a square of the radius. Now, it turns out as drops fall faster, the air that moves around the drop develops a turbulent boundary layer, and you get a wake. And so you, you get a more complex flow around a droplet, which changes how fast the terminal velocity of the droplet is. But the interesting thing is if you didn't have this turbulent boundary layer falling around, around the, 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 the edge of a, a raindrop, so if, if that wasn't turbulent, it would mean, remember, R squared, so 10 to the squared. And look at the difference in the size between a cloud droplet and a raindrop. What you would find is that the, the cloud drop, the raindrops, if they could get that big, they wouldn't, but if they could get that big, if it wasn't for little turbulent boundary layers around each drop, this little wake, they'd be supersonic. The droplets would be moving faster than the speed of sound. So imagine being hit by a supersonic raindrop, right? It'd be coming at 340 meters a second. It would be, you wouldn't just be getting wet, you would be really miserable. Um, so again, this is another thing where you see simple aspects of, 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 um, uh, fluid dynamics help have very defining properties for our atmosphere and its ability, this, this separation of keeping cloud droplets um, suspended in the air. The fact that you get turbulent boundary layers allow them to grow big enough so that rain production is efficient. So 
hopefully here I've shown you two sides of water. One is this water vapor side, which controls the infrared properties of the atmosphere. And the other is this condensed phase size, which controls the albedo of the planet. So the albedo of the planet is about 0.3. It's about twice what it would be if there was no water in the atmosphere. So water plays a fundamental role in the energy balance because the amount of water regulates the emission height, the, the, height of, the amount of radiation that the planet loses. And it also regulates to, to a large degree how much radiation the Earth keeps from the sun because it scatters a fair amount of the energy back, about 30% of the, the energy back. So these are the two sides of water. And if you understand these, you can really understand a lot about the atmosphere. You can understand. Um, Something as simple as, as, as um, how much it rains. So does anyone know the global amount of rainfall, if you average over the Earth, how much it rains per year, roughly? It's another nice number. It's a meter. Um, so you get about a meter of rainfall over the, uh, over the Earth, about, um, yeah, about, a, a, about a meter spread over the year. And the question is, why do you have that amount of rainfall? How does that work? And the, and the way it works is because the atmosphere is opaque in the infrared, if you look at the atmosphere, what's happening is that it's losing more radiation out the top of the atmosphere than it's getting from the surface. So the atmosphere here, it's, it's radiating energy in, in, out of the infrared. That means it loses a lot of energy this way, and it loses a lot of energy that way. It turns out it's getting energy back from the surface because the surface is warm. So it's getting a net input of energy here, this 0.26, from the surface because it's losing a big chunk and getting some back. Uh, and getting more back than it loses, but it's losing a lot out the top. So overall, the atmosphere is cooling. So that the, the infrared properties of the atmosphere keeps trying to cool the atmosphere, and it's cooling it at about a degree or two a day. So the question is, what balances that? And what balances that is the condensation of water in the atmosphere. So the way you balance this energy deficit in the atmosphere, which is caused by the radiative properties of the water molecule, the way that gets balanced is by evaporating water and condensing it and forming rain. And so just by understanding the radiative properties of water, you can understand how much it will rain. Um, and you can work this out as a radiative calculation. If you took out the radiative properties of water, and this is a, 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 funny, a funny business, if you, say, if you said, let's let the atmosphere be transparent to water, water vapor, what you would find is it wouldn't rain. So here, this is the same calculation. And this is an atmosphere that has water. And this shows you how much radiation it's losing as, as compared to what it's getting from the surface in the thermal infrared, in the red areas. This is the same calculation with a, with a rather elaborate model, but the same calculation for an atmosphere where the water is transparent. And what it tells you, if it wasn't for water in the atmosphere, and this is a subtle, a subtle statement, if it wasn't for water in the atmosphere, it wouldn't rain. Now you say, well, that. That, that sounds pretty trivial, right? If it wasn't for water, it wouldn't rain. But the, the subtle part of that is it's the radiative properties of water which cause it to rain. Of course, the rain happens to be in the form of water. It's sort of a secondary aspect. But the need to rain, the need for the atmosphere to rain, is caused by the radiative properties of water. So the, so the water begets itself um, in a way. Which brings us to an aspect of water which again makes the atmosphere rather fascinating is because the atmosphere, amount of water in the atmosphere, is closely tied to the temperature. This is probably the most important equation in the atmospheric sciences. It's a direct consequence of the um, second law. And it expresses the equilibrium between two phases. And that's the saturation vapor pressure. E is the pressure, S is saturation. It's the relationship between the saturation vapor pressure and the temperature. And it turns out, because of the property of waters, this proportionality through this factor beta is very unusual, is very large for water. But the important point here is this, this the, the, the logarithms here, this nearly exponential dependence of water vapor saturation on temperature, which means that when you look through the atmosphere, and here I've, I've, I've made a plot taking data from this European Center for Reanalysis that, that Rupert introduced before. And what I've shown is this is taken from different pressure levels in the atmosphere. And this tells you how much water vapor there is in the atmosphere as a function of different temperatures. So I take all the data from this pressure level, and I say, let's take all of the data that has these temperatures, and let's calculate how much water there is. And on average, there's that much water. With the, there's a little line there, what you can't see, which is the amount of variance. But what you find is that the scaling of water in the atmosphere, these colored dots, follow very strongly this black line. And this is this line that's predicted by this equation. 
So water in the atmosphere is controlled by the temperature in the atmosphere, but the temperature in the atmosphere is controlled by the amount of water. So there's this beautiful dance that's going on between water and temperature in the atmosphere. Because temperature determines how much water stays in the atmosphere, but water determines what the temperature is. In a way, water, when you think radiatively, water is giving temperature opacity. It's coloring. It's giving temperature color. Um, and because of that, you can understand a fair amount of um, things like uh, in terms of climate change. So if we, look at, if we look at climate change and you look at the pieces that go into it, we say that the amount of water determines the radiative properties of the atmosphere. And we say things like the thermal structure, um, the lapse rate determines how the atmosphere will respond to radiation. And this, this comes from water as well. So again, the slope, remember I mentioned the fact that if the lapse rate, the change in temperature was constant here, that we'd have a very different greenhouse effect than if it was like this. Um, so why do we have this shape? shape? And, and when it goes back, I should go back to one slide here. This fact that water is called into being by the radiative properties of the atmosphere, because the cooling of the atmosphere draws water up into the atmosphere through deep convective clouds, the adiabatic processes that lead to the condensation of water in the atmosphere actually determine the thermal structure of the atmosphere, not just the temperature, but actually how the temperature changes with height. So if, it, if the temperature, if there was no water in the atmosphere, the temperature radiatively would change with height, it would fall off much more rapidly like this. But this thermal structure depends on water, and it depends on waters in which way, ways we know. From simple thermodynamics, we can calculate what the adiabatic temperature change is for an expansion. Um, and it turns out that this depends on temperature. Um, but this all comes from the properties of water. So from water, we know how it interacts with radiation, but we also know how water releases heat when it condenses and how that controls the thermal structure of the atmosphere. I'll skip this um, for a second here. The, the, the last interesting thing I wanted to mention about water in terms of understanding our current climate is that when you look at this point here, the temperature at the tropopause, you say, why is this 200K and this is 300K? What determines what the temperature is at the top of the troposphere? And what determines it is really again, water. And the reason is that as you go up, the temperature cools. So what happens? There's less and less water. At some point, the atmosphere becomes so cold that you run out of water. When you're flying in an airplane at, at 10 kilometers or so, there's actually more CO2 in the atmosphere than there is water. Because remember the water curve I showed before, water falls off by four orders of magnitude or, 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 or more as you move up through the atmosphere. So as the atmosphere becomes colder and colder, as you move upwards, you end up having less and less water. But the water is what's cooling the atmosphere. And that cooling the atmosphere is what's causing the convection and the condensation and this thermal structure. So as soon as there's not enough water to cool the atmosphere, the atmosphere isn't cooling anymore. And other things like ozone absorb radiation and warm the atmosphere. So water acts like a thermostat through the clausius clapeyron equation for controlling the height of the tropopause. So you, you know that this temperature will be about 200 Kelvin, because at colder temperatures, you can't have enough water there to be radiatively active. And if you don't have enough water, you won't cool the tropopause here anymore. And so the water, in a way, defines this whole weather layer because of the radiative cooling wa of, of, of water in the atmosphere. It d defines this overturning layer, which leads to precipitation and the whole property of our weather layer, or the tropopause. So understanding of water helps us by looking at how it mediates the, the radiative input, it helps us understand Earth's surface temperature. It helps us understand the strength of the hydrological cycle. We can understand how much it will rain and how much the rain will change um, just by what we know about the radiative property of water. It helps us understand the structure of the troposphere, both how deep it is, because we know the rate of change of temperature given by thermodynamics in the troposphere because of water. And we also know the temperature at the top, so that tells us the depth of the troposphere. Um, so we get the vertical structure and the depth of the troposphere by the radiative properties of water. And it also tells us something about the relative sizes of areas where the atmosphere is going up versus going down, but, um, but that I, I, I didn't go into so much. So understanding of water explains the basic properties of the atmosphere, but it also guides our thinking as how the atmosphere will change um, as a, res a response to perturbation.
And so a lot of times, this comes to the, the global warming argument or the climate change argument, a lot of times the, the basic ideas of climate change is sort of hidden behind these complicated models with tractors in the pictures showing them farming land and creating dust and, and rivers wiping away things and stuff like this. But, but really when you think about the atmosphere just as a, a, a problem in planetary atmospheres, and you say, what if you do something like you double the CO2, how much the temperature would change? And you can just calculate that using an understanding of radiative transfer. And if you double CO2, what you would find there's no water in the atmosphere. What you would find is that the temperature would increase at the surface because of a change in radiative properties by about one degree Kelvin or one, one Kelvin or one degree Celsius. Best estimates put it at about 1.15 and there's a little bit of uncertainty and this is just bookkeeping uncertainty, just not doing the calculation very precise. Um, so you get about one degree. And then you say, well, how does our understanding of water change that? And what you can say is that the, the basic things we understand about water, so how water connects to temperature. So this idea that as you warm the, 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 the planet, the, the temperature will rise and the amount of water that will be in the atmosphere will also rise because it has to be near saturation in order to produce the precipitation that has to balance the energy. The lapse rate will change because that's controlled by the adiabat. So that gives you an increment of the temperature here that brings you to this temperature there. You can say how will the effect of the, the clouds will be higher because the tropopause will deepen, because that tropopause temperature stays the same, that, that brings you from this temperature here to here. And then surface ice will melt, so the, the planet will overall get, 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 get darker and absorb more radiation, and that gives you this increment. And so if you put these things, these are things we understand very well. They're very simple arguments. They're related to very basic properties of water. If you put that together, what you end up with is the best estimate of the amount of warming, which is about twice that you would get if there was no water in the atmosphere. Um, here it's a little bit more than twice of that. And in a way, these assumptions are, are, are sort of rigorous assumptions, but there's a fair amount of scatter here. And again, this scatter is, is just due to bookkeeping sloppiness, because people haven't spent a lot of time really trying to calculate carefully what, if you assume in a strict mathematical way, that the tropopause was fixed at temperature, if the atmosphere did follow the moist adiabatic lapse rate, and so on what this change would be. So this is very easy to narrow down just by doing more careful calculations. And this, I would say, is what we really understand about water in the atmosphere. This is, this is understanding. Then we take those very complicated models which have that understanding somewhere deep inside their guts. They have good fluid dynamical representations, and they have a lot of things that people make up in terms of you know, how trees grow and things like this into the, uh, in the planet. And if you put that in models, lots of other things happen. But they don't really wander that far away from our basic understanding. So this is the same calculation done with models which have more degrees of freedom than I allowed in this calculation. And they allow the influence of lots of things that we don't really understand very well. Um, and what you see is you see a larger spread, but it's quite close to what we say our understanding is. And this gives climate scientists confidence in the models. We don't, we don't say the planet's going to warm because the models say they're going to warm. We say the planet's going to warm because the things we understand about water um, seem, seem, make it hard to think about it not warming. Um, and the models more or less capture that with a larger spread. And you can ask yourself, I have calculated here, I have 10 minutes, but I might have less because sometimes this clock starts separately. So how much time? Maybe I have eight?
what the clouds will do. This is changing here in the deep tropics in a way that will cool the atmosphere, and here it's warming. And here it's warming and kind of not doing a whole lot here. And these are just four different models developed by four different groups. And it tells you that the main driver of our uncertainty has very little to do with all of the complexity we put in the models because we can take most of it out. And what we find is, if anything, the spread of the models is even larger. Because right now, all and this is the point that I'm saying, almost everything that we don't understand about the atmosphere has to do with water as well. And it's really an illustration of the point that um, our lack of understanding of how clouds will change in even very simplified future climates limit our ability to say um, um, with precision how much the Earth will warm in the future. It's fairly clear it will warm, but how much, whether it's 2 degrees or 5 degrees, that's the difference between this model and this model. That's the French and that's the Germans. So I guess that's Euler and, well. So I'm going to skip across to the end here because you can extend this talk to precipitation um, and make many of the similar points. I'll, I'll show one last slide here is that a lot of the economy about the different futures. And so often people get very elaborate in terms of the different future. They say, let's let CO2 go up like this. Let's let the sulfate aerosol do that. Let's let land use do this. Let's let China do that. And you come up with these very elaborate scenarios about how the future might be different. And then you calculate them with your complicated models. And even if the projector was better, what you find here are four scenarios, but they're shown in a little different way. The way in which they're different is that I've normalized out the mean change. And I just look at the pattern. And what you, what you find is that you really can't tell any of these scenarios apart in the models. Um, so the, the only thing that's different between these four scenarios, this is temperature and this is precipitation. And if you like, I can show this to you more closely on the, on the screen here. But it's very hard to tell the difference between a historical scenario, what's happened over the last 100 years, from a scenario, what will happen the next two or 300 years, after you take out the global mean change which again is telling you the thing that controls the global mean change, water, is ruling the day, and all of the complexity that we're putting in the system is just kind of confusing us and giving us this delusion of specificity. So um, insufficient understanding of water explains imprecision in estimates of global changes, but also deficiencies in regional projections. Um, so what I would like to do at the end is just reiterate these points. Um, most of what we know about our atmosphere, climate, and climate change is tied to an understanding of water. The important things that we don't know are similarly tied to a lack of understanding of water. And many of the other things that are vogue in climate science actually matter much, much less um, than simply understanding how water behaves in the atmosphere. So with that, I'd thank you and um, wish you a good night. <laughs>